a clinical dietitian for St. Mary's Health Center, <coughs> KMIZ TV registered dietitian on Morning News Show, and that was from 2000 to 2002. <coughs> Presently, she is the program coordinator for the Weight Treatment Center for Jefferson City Medical Group. Um, her early college education was interrupted by, surprise, two twins, <laughs> <laughs> followed by another daughter two years later. When she was able to refocus her education, Miss Finley changed her major from accounting to the dietetics to pursue her personal interests of health, fitness, and cooking. She states it has been one of the best decisions she has ever made. <laughs> she has a passion for good health and good food. <laughs> Please welcome, without further ado, Miss Lisa Williams Finley. Good morning to all of you, and good morning to our satellite locations, too. My goodness, after that introduction. I hope I don't disappoint, that was awfully uh, kind. Um, what Deborah did share with you though is that I do have a passion for health and if anything I hope to challenge your idea of what a dietitian <coughs> represents. Uh, one of the disappointing things I often encounter is that people think that dietitians are food police. Oh, I don't want that term. Um, but to be honest, a lot of my colleagues are very passionate about helping people and, and, uh, and I hope that I can convey that to you today in a kind and caring way. A lot of the work that I do um, is fueled by passion and inspiration and I hope that comes through in my presentation today. How many of you have ever found yourself in the, in the position of saying to yourself or even saying to a close friend, I know what to do, I just can't seem to do it. <laughs> Oh, I bet everyone in the room can say that, myself included. Because you see, life is all about changing and growing, and, and that doesn't happen by accident, does it? No. <laughs> and so, when we're thinking about um, starting a new habit, or even breaking a habit that we think needs to be changed, it's not easy, but it isn't impossible either. And so I hope that my presentation today um, helps you see and understand how habits are formed. And we're even going to get into the emerging field of neuroscience. Um, but the, looking at how habits are formed helps us understand how we can begin to work with that information to make the changes that we want to make. And that leads us to being the best that we can be. So having said that, let's start there. I want to begin with an important quote today. Habits play an important role in our health. Understanding the biology of how we develop routines that may be harmful to us and how to break those routines and embrace new ones could help us change our lifestyles and adopt healthier behaviors. Now that's a quote from Dr. Nora Volko who works for the NIH on drug use. And certainly that is a, a problematic habit. But what she's suggesting with that quote is the biology, the inner workings of our body, has something to do with these habits. And that, in a nutshell, is the field of neuroscience. By the way, the field of neuroscience is the most emerging and exciting field when we look at drug development for uh, conditions like overeating and, uh, and even some of the more problematic, uh, abusive type of behaviors. But this is an important field and it's exciting. And if anybody's working in the area of behavior change, um, they certainly need to be up to date on what's going on in this field. So I hope to give you a layman's introduction to that, to that field today. I want you to think of biology as the internal workings of your body. Now, how many of you are familiar with the inner workings of a car or a vehicle? <laughs> I have to admit that I'm not. But what I've heard over the years from uh, relatives who used to tinker on cars is it's a lot more complex now. You have to have almost a computer science degree to understand how to fix a car. All I know is that if I don't get into that car and if it doesn't start, I'm in trouble. But the idea that we need a computer science degree to work on our vehicles, I want you to use that, that analogy for thinking about how your body works. You see, you have a whole internal working system in your physical body 
that is like a vehicle for your spirit. Let me say that again. Your physical body has a whole internal working system that houses your spirit. Your body is a vehicle for your spirit. And when that doesn't work properly, you run into problems, don't you? So let's go ahead and look at what I consider to be your body, your physical body, or your, your brain, which is the processing center. As you look at this slide, is that slide coming up on the projection at all? If not, then I'm just going to ask you to look at your handouts. But on one of your handouts, you've got a handout, uh, a slide entitled, your, ba your Brain is Your Body's Processing Center. Does everybody see that slide on your handouts? Okay. What you'll notice is, and what I want you to think about, is your brain is always taking in information. And we see, um, in this picture of the brain, you've got sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. Those are your senses. And your brain is constantly taking in that information. Like, right now, I'm taking in information about the temperature of the room, the lighting, all of your faces, whether, um, you know, whether people are looking at me or whether I'm looking at you. All of that's being processed even as I think about what I want to say to you. And that's called the environment. Your body takes in information from things around you in the environment. But there's also some internal processing going on. And that comes into body sense, intuition, your feelings, maybe even your memories. Did any of you happen to be here a couple of years ago, perhaps, when I spoke with your group? Maybe not. But, but the point is that our brain is always working on information outside of our bodies and information that's internal. And all of that comes together in an interesting way when we look at habits. So let's go ahead and look at environment first. Environment influences our habits, and what we have here is a slide that reminds us in uh, the first um, picture, we've got a man standing there. Um, what's on the table behind him? Looks like a box of candy, doesn't it? What do you imagine he's saying to himself? Oh, yeah. There's, there's definitely an internal debate going on there, isn't there? So his body's thinking of the fact that candy's there, but something internal is going on. You can see it on his face. The second picture, which focuses on routine. I can imagine after many years of talking with clients, uh, in fact, one client comes to mind, he was so happy and so excited because he was able to break the habit of stopping at a convenience store every morning and buying a, a large latte, <laughs> which represented about 500 calories for him every morning. But the point is that he was so, in that routine was so much a part of his morning that he found it a struggle to break that habit. But that's definitely part of our environment, isn't it? And then the third um, slide reminds us that there's a sense of reward. Ouch. So when our habits end up in something that kind of feels pleasurable to us, what do you think that means for breaking that habit? Oh, now we're in trouble, aren't we? Yeah. He enjoyed that morning latte. And so there was a part of him that really didn't want to give that up. But there was another part of him that wanted something different. And that's what started the conversation for him. On the next page, you want to look at uh, internal. What's going on internally? And that has to do with feelings and thoughts, memories. All of that's housed in our brain. Did you realize that you have a processing center that just stores your memories? And today, you are a product of everything that's ever happened to you. That shapes us as we grow, doesn't it? Feelings and thoughts and memories can work to our advantage or it can work to our disadvantage, can't it? Have any of you ever found yourself being overwhelmed or angry and then doing something you wish to have not done? Yeah. Yeah. Like maybe eating a bag of chips or a box of cookies. So, environment outside, environment internally. I want to mention too that self-talk the things that we say to ourselves really comes into play here. How many of you are aware of what you say to yourself? I hope so. It's a very important guide, isn't it? Sometimes we can be kind to ourselves, and sometimes what happens? Sometimes we kind of beat up on ourselves, don't we? So self-talk can be very, very important to think about. Well, let's take a different tack on this, and let's look at how habits, how some of our habits are actually helpful. 
Let's see how it works for our advantage. And so I have here some habits that work to my advantage in the morning. When I brush my teeth, when I when I brush my teeth, it's the same time every morning. It's in the same order of everything else I do in the morning, so I don't forget it. Have you ever traveled somewhere and all of a sudden you forget to brush your teeth because you're not home? <laughs> How many of you put your car keys in the same place every time you walk in the house? How does that help you? It avoids having to look for them, doesn't it? You bet. There's nothing more frustrating than looking for your car keys when you be somewhere on time. So I have a habit of always putting my car keys in the same place every day because I don't want to waste time doing that. Taking medication. How many of you have a routine about taking medication in the morning? And what happens if that routine gets messed up for some reason? Do you kind of forget it? It's hard to remember, isn't it? And how many of you drive the same route to the grocery store or to church every Sunday? What happens when you have to go to a different way? It's harder, isn't it? <laughs> so let's face it, some of these routines are actually helpful for us because they, they're very efficient, they're speedy, we don't have to donate brain time to thinking about that. They're almost automatic, aren't they? That's an advantage for us. But what does that tell us about the habits that we'd like to change? So maybe we can use some of that information to help us. Let's go ahead and look at a tool. This is a tool that we use in behavior uh, management. It's called behavior chain analysis. And let's just take brushing teeth, for example. If I wanted to break down why I brush my teeth the same way every day, it's a series of steps, isn't it? And so on this example, we see that I go to the bathroom and I grab my toothbrush, then I get the toothpaste, then I open it, then I put the toothpaste on the toothbrush, I brush my teeth, I spit, rinse, put everything away, and all of that sandwich in between breakfast and checking to make sure I have everything ready before I give my dogs their treat and walk out the house. Now my dogs know this routine so well that they're poised on the carpet there in the hallway because they know when I brush my teeth, I'm five minutes from walking out the door. <laughs> That's how routine it is. But do you see the series of steps that allows that helpful routine to happen? And that's what we can learn from a behavior chain analysis. Every one of those things is linked to something else. And that's part of what makes it so automatic. So moving on to what goes on in our brain, I want you to think of it this way. When we have those automatic helpful habits that are linked like that, it's almost like creating a super highway in your brain. Now please bear with me for a moment because I'm going to use some technical language. But when you have a repetitive habit, what's happening in your brain is it's laying down neurons or paths or highways. And along those paths or highways, there are chemicals that relay that message along that highway. Now when I have a helpful habit, like brushing my teeth, that is a well-worn interstate in my, in my head. It's efficient, it's speedy. So when you drive down I-70, you don't have traffic coming in from the side, do you? It's a highway that's intended for one purpose only, which is to move you through Missouri. <laughs> that's what a routine is like in your brain. And so this picture really illustrates the fact that these are super highways. Now, what does that mean for the habits that we don't care for? Are those super highways too? Can be, can't they? In fact, they can be a highway that we feel stuck on because we'd like to get off that interstate, wouldn't we? <laughs> it's helpful when we think of these things in images because it also reminds us that highways can be rebuilt. Right? Right. <coughs> I don't like feeling stuck. And if I identify, and I'm going to be just like anybody else in this world, where none of us are perfect, so we're always going to be identifying something that we'd like to think about changing. I don't like being stuck in something that I feel isn't helpful for me. And sometimes I think of that on my own, and sometimes something brings that to my attention. <laughs> we can gather information in, in a variety of ways. But I don't like feeling stuck. <coughs> the good news is we don't have to be stuck. 
Um, going on to uh, problem habits, we can use that behavior chain analysis, and this slide reminds us that even in the field of substance abuse, for example, um, and, and by the way, in the term, in the field of weight management, there are, I, I hear from a lot of my clients, language that reminds me that sometimes food overuse feels a lot like that to that person. They'd like to be able to eat less, but they don't seem to be able to. And so, um, so looking at some of the parallels in different fields of self-care is helpful sometimes. This is a, an example taken from a, a substance abuse um, uh, program. And what it reminds us is, is this chain of events. Now they use different language. They use the language of ABC. ABC stands for antecedents, what happened in the beginning. B, behavior, how did I respond to that? And then C, what were the consequences? Now going back to that guy who was looking at the candy <laughs> on the table, what was the antecedent in that case? Somebody left that darn candy on the table. <laughs> That's the antecedent. But what's going on in his brain reminds him that he can choose his behavior. He's recognizing that he has a choice, and it's a little bit of a debate, as you noticed on his face. And then sometimes we have consequences. I, I don't like to think of consequences as punishment. I like to think of consequences as teachers. They teach us something. They're not meant to punish us, but they help guide us as to what we might want to do next. Right? Because that incident might occur again. So consequences can be good teachers. In the field of weight management, a behavior chain analysis looks a little bit like this. And let me take you through this lady's day and ask yourself if any of you have ever felt this way. She begins by skipping lunch because she's got so much to do. So I'll just skip lunch and power right on through these errands or take care of grandchildren or whatever, and, and I, I, I won't eat lunch right now. But then she finds herself going to the grocery store, and that's the second chain. By the way, the gold chains represent antecedents and behaviors. We're going to come back to those blue boxes in a minute, so follow this chain with me. So then she goes shopping, and while she's at the grocery store, of course she's hungry because she hasn't eaten lunch. What's going to happen? She bought cookies because they looked good and she was hungry. So then she gets home, she's unpacking the groceries and leaves those cookies on the counter and she's tired and frustrated. Probably not the best time making decisions, right? <laughs> and then it's about 3.30 or 4 o'clock, the kids are coming home from school. Are your kids ever happy when they come home from school or kind of fussy? Grandchildren, you guys are probably taking care of grandchildren after school sometimes. Sometimes they're kind of fussy, and they can, uh, so in this particular situation, she has to settle a children's fight. Now keep in mind, she hasn't had lunch, she's tired and hungry, those cookies are on the counter, settling a children's fight, so she's frustrated, she walks in the kitchen, what happens? She grabs those cookies. <laughs> I'm tired, I'm frustrated, I'm going to grab those cookies. She realizes she's tired, so she goes to her easy chair in the living room, and turns on the television. Oh boy. <laughs> and then her feelings come in. Then she starts feeling anxious and guilty about doing all of that because she had resolved perhaps to, to eat only a two, but now half the package is gone. <laughs> so she feels bad. So what does she do? She eats the rest of the, of the package so nobody will know the ever existed. <laughs> How many of you can relate to that? This is a very real human challenge. Yeah. But do you see the interplay of environment and emotions? And what's really interesting is to see how all of that built um, over a series of steps. That's the benefit of a behavior chain analysis. Now, if this happened once in a while, it wouldn't be that big a deal. But what if this t particular situation happens in her life fairly frequently? And her doctor is advising her, you know, you really need to cut back on the sweets. So that's what brings our attention to, you know, yes, this kind of feels good in the moment, but I'm tired of being, um, I'm tired of having to manage my health the way I am. So here, here's a consequence that brings to her attention something that um, she might want to evaluate. This tool can help us see how repetitive behaviors develop, but more importantly, each one of those blue boxes helps us see what other choice we could make at every link in that chain. So, for instance, instead of skipping lunch, um, 
she could say, well, I'm not going to skip lunch anymore. I'm going to take care of it there. I'm going to make sure I have lunch every day so that I'm not hungry when I go to the grocery store, yada, yada, yada. Uh, or what if she um, looks at link two, shop from a list, make sure I have a little snack before I go to the grocery store, and so on. I'm not going to take you through that whole diagram. But the point is that when we get all of those confusing thoughts out of our head and put it on paper, we can think about our choices a little more clearly. And just seeing your choices is the first step. By the way, we know from behavior management, the quicker you take care of that chain, the easier it is to take to solve that problem. It's a lot more difficult if you wait until you're at the bottom of that chain. Because by that time, her feelings and emotions have, um, have really uh, become more involved with that decision. So, this does sound familiar. Let's look at this next slide. This little girl says, don't step on it, it makes you cry. <laughs> <laughs> but we can all relate to that too. Yeah. Going back to feeling stuck. Not only does that person feel stuck, but they feel overwhelmed and they feel disappointed. And that's not a good place to be. So, the good news is that neuroscience offers us a different choice. What I want you to think about is this new term called plasticity. Plasticity is your brain's ability to change. That's the exciting news today. You don't have to be stuck. Plasticity or neuroplasticity is the lifelong, did you guys see that? Lifelong ability of the brain to reorganize those superhighways based on new experiences. And as we learn, we acquire new knowledge and skills through instruction or experience. Many of you here are the benefactors of much experience and wisdom. <laughs> In order to learn or memorize a fact or skill, there must be persistent functional changes in the brain that represent the new knowledge. So key words here, lifelong. You're never too old to learn something new, despite what other people tell you. <laughs> and the fact that you're even here today tells me that you believe that. So you've got a lifelong ability to learn new skills. The other key word here is persistent. That superhighway doesn't become real just because you wish it into existence. What creates that superhighway? Repetition of these. You bet. Practice, practice, and more practice. Because the more you practice that new skill, what's going to wither away? No. Oh, old highway. Yeah. yeah. Another important quote, and this is from a doctor who wrote a book called Spark. And Spark is about how activity can help your brain be healthier. His quote is, our own free will may be the strongest force directing the development of our brains, and therefore, our lives. The adult brain is both plastic and resilient and always eager to learn. Again, that's, that's reinforced by your presence here today. And that's good news. So let's go ahead and look at how to keep our brain healthy. Another quote from Dr. Rady. I call exercise miracle grow for the brain. Exercise keeps those brain cells healthy in a way that even playing chess or other highly cognitive activities do not. How many of you have made a commitment to reading the paper every day? And doing puzzles? And interacting with friends? Okay. All of those are examples of ways to keep your brain healthy. Because if you don't use it, you lose it. Yeah. So all of those things keep your brain healthy, but have you ever thought of a 20 or 30 minute walk in the morning as a way to keep your brain healthy? I know a lot of people talk about exercise as a way to burn calories. I think that's boring. <laughs> I'd rather get up and take a walk every morning because it lifts my spirits and it reminds me of how big a world I live in. And it reminds me of the beauty of nature and oh, by the way, it gets my brain going. I do find that when I'm pondering a problem on that walk, sometimes the solution kind of comes to me. So maybe there's something to this, huh? Mm -hmm. What you see on the right-hand side is that specifically, 
Exercise increases the production of chemicals that promote cell brain, or brain cell repair. It improves your memory. It lengthens your attention span, boosts your decision-making skills, prompts the growth of new nerve cells. There's where that superhighway is. Mm -hmm. And it improves multitasking and planning. Wow. Let's look at what might not be so healthy for our brain. And this is according to the World Health Organization. Number one on there is skipping breakfast. Mm -hmm. You need fuel for your body. That car that we talked about earlier, even though it has a computer in it, it still doesn't run without fuel, right? right. And I have a lot of clients who, when we're looking at behavior changes that would help them, some of them are skipping breakfast and sometimes even skipping lunch, and then unfortunately they load up that gas tank right before they go to bed. <laughs> now, how many of you would run a car on fumes all day, fill up the gas tank, and then park it in the garage? And yet, how many of us do that with our bodies? We need to put some fuel in the gas tank first thing in the morning. Second one is overeating. Uh, third on the list, smoking. Fourth on the list, high sugar consumption. I think in Missouri we're fairly, fairly lucky when it comes to air pollution. Let's give a shout out for that. <laughs> and we have clean air to breathe. Sleep deprivation, though, is something I encounter a lot with individuals. So what you can do to promote good sleep is a good idea. And then, interestingly enough, sleeping with your head covered at night. I can't imagine doing that personally, but I have a husband who does that. It just baffles me. Could you tell me why that's damaging? It's a lack of oxygen, most likely. I'm just guessing. But if your head's covered, maybe you're not getting as much oxygen while you're sleeping. But I think it's I'm just more, guessing. Sorry. I think Go it's ahead. your face. Like, they're talking about if your whole face is covered by a blanket or something. Yeah, a lot of people like to not, sleep not a like a, over their face. Not like a hat. Yeah, yeah. Not the head, but your, but your face. Um, and I'm just guessing. But... I would imagine that because no, oxygen is healthy for us. Real, realizing that I sleep with a mask on, mm -hmm. um, oxygen mask. Sure, yeah. But I'm still sleeping during the daytime and I cover my head because my head gets cold. Oh. But I'm still, <laughs> I still feel sleep deprived even though I'm yeah. getting oxygen. Well, and actually, so, this does hint at sleep apnea, which is a, it's a medical situation that can result from overweight. Now, not everyone who's overweight has sleep apnea. Not everyone who has sleep apnea is overweight. But the two do have an association. And, and sleep apnea is inadequate oxygen while you're sleeping. Yeah. It's I wear definitely the mask, but I still sleep And that helps. Yeah, 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 that helps. You'd be in big trouble without that. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so you're doing I mean, something now. The weight, I think. Get right. the weight off, I think. You're doing something now, though, that does help your brain. Uh -huh. Because if you weren't getting oxygen, that'd be harmful to your brain. Mm -hmm. So it's one good thing you're doing. Yeah. Okay. Um, working your brain during illness. If you've ever had a friend or relative that's... Yes, I'm sorry. What is it about covering your head? I think it's more about covering your face. Um, not, not this part of your head, but covering your face. Do not cover your face. Yeah. I, I agree. The way they describe it is a little, a little confusing. Um, how many of you have ever had friends or relatives, perhaps, who've suffered a stroke? And part of stroke recovery is resting. You shouldn't be trying to do difficult things in the initial stages of a stroke. You should allow that person to recover, and then um, in the later stages, they work um, to reestablish some of those skills. And the last two on here, a lack of stimulating thoughts and rarely talking. This is why it's important that you're here today. Social interaction in groups like this with friends, even going for a walk and talking with a friend, all of that's important as we age, and it keeps our brain healthy. So don't avoid those, those opportunities. Going on, I like to emphasize that behavior change is not an on or off switch. Boy, I have a lot of people that wish it was. <laughs> just tell me what to do. Let's just change it. It's a process. And this slide reminds us that there are different stages of changing behaviors. The first stage we look at is pre-contemplation. Now, this is actually where someone's really unaware. Okay? This lady that um, bought the cookies or skipped lunch, you know, maybe she just really wasn't aware. Maybe that had to happen two or three times in a row before she went, wow, I'm tired of this happening. What can I do? 
So sometimes we're just not aware. That's pre-contemplation. The next stage is contemplation. Okay, now we're aware. It's on our radar screen. And we kind of need to think about what we might want to do. So contemplation means we're just aware and thinking. Preparation is the next stage. You don't just jump into something. I like for people to map out a plan so that hopefully they can see some success early on. So preparing to be successful needs to happen before we actually take action. So for instance, if I was the guy with the candy on the counter, what, would I, what kind of conversation would I be having with my family if I wanted to be successful? <laughs> you, need, you guys need to hide that stuff and put it somewhere else, right? <laughs> not let me know what's in the house. Because if I don't see it, then I'm probably not going to have to have that internal, internal conversation with myself. Um, so action. I've laid out my plan. I've talked to my family. I've taken those steps. Now I'm ready to take action. And even that doesn't necessarily be, going to mean be successful. I like to use the action phase as the experiment stage. Please write that term down. When you write, uh, I'm sorry, when you take an action, you're experimenting with what you think will work. It's okay if it doesn't. It only means you need to go back to the drawing board, right? Experiment, or using that word, takes a lot of judgment out of the situation. And it gives us the freedom to be more creative about our solutions. And then the last stage is maintenance. That's the practice stage where you're laying down that super highway. Now the thing is, any of us can be in any of those stages. And sometimes we get to one stage and we drop down a couple of steps. That's okay. That's part of the process. But my, my emphasis here is that it's not an on or off switch. Here's a guy that tells his wife, well, my doctor told me to start my exercise program very gradually. <laughs> Today I drove past a store that sells sweatpants. <laughs> what stage is he in, though? <laughs> well, he actually took an action. Well, yes, you're right. He drove past the store. Now, if he'd gone into the store and bought the sweatpants, he would have been in action. Or maybe even the prep stage. Because you've got to have the sweatpants before you can walk every morning. But... Now, some people might laugh at that as doing nothing, but actually he did something, didn't he? Mm -hmm. He got one step closer. <clears throat> so as we think about the changes that we want to make, it's really important to back out with the big picture. And our dreams or our visions are a good place to start. If I was to happen to sit down with one of you in a private place and I said, tell me what your best vision is is for your health. What would you answer? What is your dream for your best health that you can be? To be healthy. <laughs> and then I might say, well, tell me what that looks like. What specifically does that look like to you? Lose weight. Okay. Exercise. No diabetes. <laughs> Better blood sugar control. No aches and pains. Less pain, yes. I, I've been feeling that since I turned 42 <laughs> and 50. <laughs> yep. Proper wrist. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes people feel stuck. So a good question for me to ask then is, well, if you change nothing, what might happen? The same results, nothing. <laughs> and then another critical question is, what is just one thing you can change? See, that vision's important, but it can feel very overwhelming. So the most important question then to say is, well, what, what is just one change I can make that gets me closer to that vision? <clears throat> Goal setting is an important skill. Um, goal setting allows us to be more specific about that one step that we can take that gets us closer to our vision. And what might happen if you were successful with just that one step? Do you think that might lead to maybe a second step or a second change? Momentum is a wonderful thing. <laughs> and too many times people start off with too long a list thinking they have to change everything all at once. When you don't, just choose one thing. Choose what feels most realistic to you at this moment. And just start with that. So I like to remind people that when you're setting goals, you want to be, you want to be a SMART goal setter. SMART is an acronym that stands for Specific, Measurable, 
action-based, realistic, and timed. And I've given you some good examples of SMART goals on this slide. One might be, I will walk in my neighborhood for 30 minutes at 8 a.m. five days weekly. Okay, that's pretty specific, isn't it? So I know day to day or week to week whether I've met that goal or not. Now if I just say, I'm going to walk more, what do you think might happen? Eh, kind of falls off the radar, doesn't it? What about the next one? I will eat five servings of fruits and vegetables every day, uh, each day on five days this week. measurable, action-oriented, realistic, and timed. And then our third goal is, I will allow myself one serving of dessert two times over the weekend each week. If I don't do that, I might want dessert every day. <laughs> so those are some examples. And they can, they can help us target a little bit more specifically what we'd like to do. The next step is collecting information. We wouldn't have been able to fill out that behavior chain unless we collected information. And so um, in your handouts today are a couple of, of, of tools just to get you started on collecting information. But honesty is important here. I have some clients who say, well, I started with a food record, but when I got to 3 o'clock, I didn't want to see what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> so honesty is really, really important. And keep in mind, you're just collecting data. It's not a reflection of whether you're a good person or a bad person. Oh my goodness, I don't like that kind of language. It's just data, right? So you're just collecting information. But I just hinted at self-talk, didn't I? So let's go on. I want to tell you what I think are the top two barriers to making changes. And the first one is how you talk to yourself. This slide reminds us to be careful what you say to yourself because you're listening. <laughs> Sometimes the voices that my clients hear aren't necessarily their own voices, but they're voices from the past. How many of you can still hear something your mom or your father said to you years ago? Yeah. And that kind of makes our makes it makes its way into our memories, and all of a sudden we we think it's our voice, and we're like, no, no, that's wow. Why am I still listening to that? Sometimes people, even well-intentioned people, want to help us, but maybe their words um, seem a little hurtful. The Buddhist tradition teaches that what we think, we become. And I'd like to mention, too, that um, when I've heard my clients saying things that are very hurtful, I'll say, wow, if you had a best friend coming to you with a problem, would you say that to your best friend? Oh, no, I would never talk to my best friend that way. <laughs> then why are you talking to yourself that way? <laughs> Help me understand that. Right? Why are we so hard on ourselves? What's the other thing was lovely, pure, or good report? Think on these things, because what you put in here is what you want to yeah. manifest in your behavior later. It's the truth to that, isn't it? So I'm going to suggest that starting with self-compassion is really the first step. Um, self-compassion defined is extending compassion to oneself in instant instances of perceived, perceived being the key word there, inadequacy, failure, or suffering. Extending compassion to oneself in perceived instances of inadequacy, failure, or suffering. This is where honesty comes in because with honesty we can face what's going on and with compassion begin to change some things that we want to change. If we start with self-compassion, we're more likely to see the possibilities for change. Because now we're not beating up on ourselves, we're seeing opportunities. Self-compassion also allows us to be more motivated to change. Because we understand it's not about doing everything perfectly. It's about learning from our experiences. Self-compassion motivates us to mimic our heroes. One of the best friends you can have is somebody who's doing something you'd like to do better. Because we tend to mimic the people whom we spend time with. And it motivates us to take steps toward making those changes. Here's a Missouri author. But I thought this was an interesting quote. 
Habit is habit, and not to be flung out of the window by any man, but instead coaxed downstairs one at a time. What does that word coaxed hint to you? Are you supposed to come at yourself? You need to do this. You should do this. You should do this. Does that help? But what if you were a best friend to yourself and said, come on, let's give this a try. Yeah. <laughs> let's just give it a try. Let's start here today. That's what coaxing is to me. The second barrier that I notice is fear. And I loved this picture. Fear has two meanings. You can forget everything and run. I think it's called denial. <laughs> or you can face it and rise. And quite often the things that we face um, brings some wonderful qualities into, into our being, doesn't it? We have a choice. Um, when I say that this is one of the most common barriers, what I'm talking about is people are afraid of failing. But they're afraid of failing because they're so overly critical of themselves. They're not giving themselves room to be human. And you need some space to be human. And Albert Einstein said it best, I think, anyone who's never made a mistake has never really tried anything new. <laughs> so this is what gets people stuck. If you're afraid of making a mistake, guess what? You're stuck on that superhighway that you don't want to be on. So get over it. Get over yourself. <laughs> um, give yourself some TLC and just understand that mistakes are part of learning. And then, sir, I think this captures what you were just saying. Watch your thoughts for they become words. Watch your words for they become actions. Watch your actions because they become habits. And watch your habits before, for they become character. And then last, watch your character for it becomes your destiny. So that's why we're talking about habits today, because it's in a much bigger picture of who we are as living, breathing spirits here, uh, moving around in these vehicles we've been given. <laughs> And then I think I was really just looking for an excuse to use a quote from this book because this was my favorite book of all time this year. And if you have a chance to read it, please read this book. It's called Made for Goodness by uh, Desmond Tutu. I love this quote, though. The goodness that is our true home has no finger wagging attached to it and no reproachful should. The striving and shame that are hallmarks of being good are replaced by wholeness and the experience of being at peace with ourselves at home in our own skin. Don't you just love that? Yes. Now the reason I wanted to share that quote with us today is that if we remember our starting point is already that we're good, then we're more compassionate with ourselves and we learn from consequences and we understand that it's just a process to help nudge us in a different direction. That's all it is. And we were never expected to be perfect. Yeah. So mistakes are okay. In fact, one of the most gratifying experiences I have working um, at Jeff City Medical Group is watching as people become healthier. What we get to see and observe is how people come out of their shells and it uncovers something wonderful that was always there. It's just, it's just that their health was limiting the expression of that. And this next quote, take care of your body, it's the only place you have to live. <laughs> While our spirits are here, we have a physical home. And we might want to consider taking better care of that vehicle because it does allow the expression of everything we were created to be. Pain and poor health limits our potential. And if we look at health that way, I think we see it in a completely different light. As we wrap this up, I wanted you to be aware of some free resources that are available to you through uh, the Veterans Health Administration and Department of Health and Senior Services here at Missouri. You do have a few of those with your handouts because I thought if I just gave you a little bit of a teaser, you might be more interested in, in playing with some of those tools. So I've given you a couple to look at. And then just for some ongoing inspiration, I wanted to mention some books that I think are very, very helpful to people. Um, Judith Beck is a psychologist who wrote a book called The Beck Diet Solution, 
I wish that she had renamed it, however, because the whole book is about how to talk more effectively to yourself. And it helps us uncover negative self-talk and replace it with helpful self-talk. So that's the purpose of that book. The second book, Mindless Eating by Brian Wansink, fo focuses on what we can change in our environments. Here's the deal. In your preparation stage, you want to take all of the steps in your environment to create an environment that will help you be supportive. If you don't take that step, you're always going to feel like you're swimming upstream. So restructure your environment for success, not to be challenged. That's a very important step. Um, Spark by John Rady, if you're just interested in looking at how being more active can help you have a healthier brain, it's a great book. And then last, this next book that I mentioned, uh, Stroke of Insight, this is a book that was written by a brain anatomist who suffered a stroke at the age of 35, I believe. And this, the book details her recovery from that stroke, um, which is also very helpful if you have anyone in your family or friends who have suffered a stroke, because it's a very helpful list of what you can do to help them. But here is the most exciting part of that book for me. She suffered a stroke on the left side of her brain, which made the left brain where our criticism center lives. It became inoperable for a while. And when she had the experience of living without that criticism center, or that judgment center, she purposely decided not to give that voice again when she recovered. In fact, she coined uh, a response that said, when she recognized the judgment and the self-talk that was critical, she said, oh, I don't want to hear from that peanut gallery today. <laughs> because in fact, the area of our brain where that resides is about the size of a peanut. Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? So as we wrap this up, my hope was, uh, and I apologize for going over a little longer, but I, my hope was to really help you understand what's going on in your brain and how that forms habits. Because the reality is we do have choices. We don't have to get stuck. And I hope that uh, that will help each of you just realize a, a more fully and whole way of living. So thanks for your time and attention today. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for questions today, and we're going to start with Carruthersville. Carruthersville, do you have any questions? We don't have any questions. What just a minute? <laughs> Hello. Okay, when you were mentioned again about environmental influences ha habits, there was the A, the A, B, C. What was the A? Antecedents. Pardon me? Antecedents. So there are things like cues or triggers outside of you in your environment that might present as a problem, like the candy dish on the counter or if any of you ever worked in an office, they used to have a break room where everybody would bring snacks in. Uh, so things like that. It's a challenging situation that presents. Can you think of it that way? Yes. Yes, thank you. Yes, it wasn't necessarily by your choice. It just popped up. Okay. <laughs> any other questions or comments? No, no thank you. All right, let's move up the virtual highway to Saxton. Saxton? It gives me motivation to exercise. <laughs> 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 Just joking. <laughs> Any questions? No. no. <laughs> Any comments? Can I, actually, can I respond yeah, to that? Said, she said, do you have a pill that would make her want to exercise? <laughs> I think your brain might notice the difference. <laughs> but actually, let me, let me just ask you, would a five or ten minute walk be more than you're doing now? What she said, what did she say? Please repeat it, we couldn't hear it. Would a five to ten minute walk be more than you're doing now? Yes. Yes. And would that be better than nothing? Yes. yes. So start there. <laughs> I have another suggestion for exercising. My wife and I have 
down, uh, we can go to Tai Chi at the health place for free, and Tai Chi is just so helpful for moving, and it's not stressful at all, it's not boring, okay, well. it's interesting and really helps a lot. And it's especially geared towards seniors because everything is slow and it doesn't stretch and it doesn't strain in the muscles. Yeah, yeah. yeah a great idea. You are yeah. absolutely right because we had Tai Chi for the 2011 meeting. So it, it, the seniors really were engaged in that. Yeah. So you're absolutely right on that. Andrew, do we have another site, St. Louis? St. Louis joined us about. All right, St. Louis. Good morning, yes, St. Louis. Good morning. Do we have any questions from St. Louis? No. No, we don't care. We guys are saying. No. I've seen Miss Paulette and Miss Louis, so they have no questions. All right. Mm -hmm. Any comments? Oh, it was a good. It was, it was good. It, it was a good. It was a good session. All right. Mm -hmm. then. But but when you take your exercise and you eat well, it's, you just do okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, we've got another comment here. I am, right. I am encouraged to do a more exercise than I've been doing because I've been kind of slacking on that. But now that encouraged me to uh, try to work out a little more. And if I don't do the exercise, I can do at least walking, uh, maybe five, ten minutes to build my step up and then mm -hmm. maybe get to 30 minutes later on. There you go. Good job. Thank you for that comment because. I would use to just walk in increments of 10 minutes and I could still see results from that. Okay, I, I took my bicycle up to the top of the hill, yes, not yesterday, but Saturday, and I rode it back down. <laughs> and I have, it's been in the basement for six years. And I bought it brand new from the bicycle shop on Dunkin'. Dunkin'. Not Dunkin'. Jefferson. Where did you park it when you got back? In the basement. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, you talking about where I put the bicycle on? Yeah, in the basement. That's where. And is that a place where you'll see it more frequently and use it more frequently? Yes, because I go out there you through go. there. That's a great way of restructuring your environment. If you put things out invisible, you're more likely to use them. So good, good step. Did you do that prior to coming today? Uh, no, I walked today. I walked up to the same place that I took the bicycle <laughs> and, and walked back there. So you're trying, yeah, good, awesome. So many people think that they have to, if they're going to exercise, they have to devote 30 minutes to an hour. Mm -hmm. And so then they do nothing. Mm -hmm. So start with what is realistic to you at this moment. And, and quite often your confidence builds where, gosh, it's 10 minutes, I, I don't really feel like I'm ready to stop now. I think I'll add another five. <laughs> Some miraculous things can happen. Um, and like I said, it's good for your brain. That's the, that's the bottom line for today. Everyone wants to age and be able to think and do and interact and be the best they can be. We have another comment. We have one more comment. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's right I'm on the right I've, I suffered a stroke about six years ago and my short term memory was affected. And I've been studying Spanish and now. I'm able to speak to Latinos in the markets and what have you. And the look on their faces when they can mm -hmm. understand me is absolutely priceless. It's worth <laughs> learning the Spanish just for that look. <laughs> they can't believe I can speak with an accent they can yeah, understand. Yeah, kudos to you for yeah. doing that. Yes. When all, I, I'm sure you have all kinds of new pathways in your brain. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was encouraged by my... Um, 75-year-old father this year who learned how to use a smartphone. And he talked about how hard it was, but he, pers he persisted. Yeah. And so now he now he can connect with his grandchildren and do Facebook and texting and all that kind of stuff. And it's, so it's been fun to watch him learn how to do something new. So he was laying down new pathways in his brain. Any more questions and comments at this time? It's good to be around younger people. It really is. Regardless of, uh, you know, in a, 
they're so entertaining, children are, mm -hmm. and even watching them grow and be a part of that growth. Yes. That, of course, we wish that we had those blessings when we had our own children, but, mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, it's very stimulating. Well, I heard several of you talking about brown children before the presentation today, and I, I just wanted to um, share with you that, and I, I'm not a grandmother yet, um, but I hear a lot of my friends and colleagues and patients talk about being grandchildren, and I just have the sense as I listen to all of you that grandparents, or being a grandparent is this wonderful opportunity to show what unconditional love looks like. <laughs> Um, and, yes, there's this benefit because children also remind us what curious learning is all about. Yes. We should never let go of that. And, and so a lot of the behavior changes that we've talked bit about today just bring an attitude of curious learning to it. That's how we learn and that's how we change. Yeah. If there aren't any more questions or comments, please join me for a round of applause. Thank you for attending our first senior service school class today. Thank you again, Ms. Finley. You did an awesome job. Yes, yes you did. Yes. Yes. You did. Yes. Yes. And of course, we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow to continue our senior summer school, which will be all of confusion. And I noticed that Ms. Patrice Dahl, who just stepped out, she will be our presenter for tomorrow. And she will basically be discussing on estate planning of that nature. So hopefully you will come back and attend tomorrow. And I look forward to seeing you all. Thank you. Feel free to stay a little longer if you want to. We have this room for 12. Thank you. Excuse me.